Babylon merchandises Christianity with rich, delicious living. This is part 142 of the Revelation study. We've been working through the book of Revelation. We're currently in Revelation 17 and 18. We're looking at Babylon, that false Christian church, which includes parachurches. It's the whole umbrella. Babylon, we're going to look at the merchandise of Christianity in this video today. To do so, we're going to look at uh, this by comparing scripture with scripture, that which is spiritual with spiritual. Jesus' words are spirit and life. Jesus is the word of God. And we're looking at the mystery, the mystery, Babylon the Great. But the angel of Revelation came to reveal and tell us the mystery of the woman. And we do that by comparing scripture with scripture. Precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little bit, there a little bit. Please consider subscribing to this channel. There's a little red button in the bottom right hand corner. And let's move on in this study. In the description section of this video, I've placed some links to things that we've studied already on Babylon and the Babylonian captivity, Great Tribulation, uh, and also some links to our website for more detailed study of, of verses on this topic about Babylon. So please consider looking at the description section and using those links for further study. Just a quick review of our study of Babylon. Babylon as the false Christian church it includes denominations, churches, parachurches, all type of organizations, Christian colleges, universities, all of them that work together in a very confused manner. It includes many saved people, but it also includes mostly unsaved people because many are called and few are chosen. I'll tag this slide with a video we've already done on 13 reasons why Babylon is the false Christian church. And Revelation 17, 18, although Babylon has existed since Genesis, in particular, Revelation 17, 18 is pointing to that period of time known as the Great Tribulation, which leads right into Judgment Day. So we're going to move on and look at Babylon, how they merchandise Christianity. First, let's look at, at the key verses on this topic today. The merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies, Babylon's delicacies. How much she has glorified herself and lived deliciously. Same Greek word as delicacy. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her. And we're going to look at what that word delicious means in the next slide. The merchants of these things which are made rich by her. And, and there's 28 uh, products, if you will, of the false Christian church Babylon, which we're going to look at in an upcoming video that's coming up on this. For in one hour so great riches has come to nothing, Babylon is very rich with all type of great riches. Alas, alas, that great city which were made rich, all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. Uh, we're going to look at these things and let's do that right now. Okay. First, we see that Babylon has great riches and delicacies. And the word rich is the word plutio, which is used all through the New Testament as someone who is either physically rich or spiritually rich. And in this context, we have to take it as the Babylon has got wealth. It's got the riches of the world. And there's an abundance, the abundance of her delicacies. The abundance there, the, the real Greek word is dunamis, which literally means power. The abundance of her delicacy. She's made rich through the power of her delicacies, which is the Greek word strenos, which means to live in luxury. So what makes Babylon rich in this world is that she has the power of luxury. The power of luxury. It's because of material things. It's because of the worshiping of other gods and idols. Her fornication is that product. It's, it's the promotion of other gods and idols, which is materialism, greed, and all type of things like that. We're going to look at the merchants and the ships of the sea. We're going to look at that in the next video. The next video, we're going to see who exactly are the merchants and what do the ships of the sea point to and they point to those who buy and sell religion we're going to look at that in the next video but for now let's keep moving on on this idea of the power of luxury in this church so how does babylon become rich so that she lives deliciously or she lives in luxury 
And the simple answer is right in Revelation. It's because of her spiritual fornication. It's her willingness to worship other gods and idols. The church should be condemning the worship of other gods and idols, condemning worldliness, condemning people in the 2.4 billion Christians that live like the world, that love the things of the world, that, that look identical to the world. Instead of condemning that, they accept it. There's no church discipline. In a lot of cases, they promote it. They get involved with worldliness. And that's how they live luxuriously. It's because they have, are going and doing spiritual fornication. We see in Revelation 18.3, all nations, all nations, again, a third of the people in this world call themselves Christian, have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. They've drunk of the wine of the wrath of worshiping other gods and idols. It's a judgment. The kings of the earth have committed fornication. So the world and the leaders of the world are all into worshiping other gods and idols, and religion justifies them. It doesn't condemn them, it justifies them, and in many ways it helps them. It serves them. The merchants are rich in the abundancy of her delicacies. And again, the kings of the earth have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her. It's through that fornication, the worshiping of other gods and idols. Gain, though, to receive all these things is not godliness. 1 Timothy 6, If any man teaches otherwise and consent not to the wholesome or the healing words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine or teaching, which is according to godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. There's many, many people that think wealth, success is measured by wealth and owning material things and spending one's time in recreation and sports and all type of other things that detract our attention from God, which are none other than other gods and idols. But godliness with contentment is great gain. The true gain is to be happy with what we have, which is Christ. Jesus Christ is what we, makes us happy. Revelation 18.4, God's people are going to be commanded to come out of her, my people, that you be not partaker of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues. Christians are not to participate in worldliness, in, in, in the, the lust for things, in the worship of other gods and idols. We have a video that we're going to do coming up soon on what it really means to come out of Babylon. So just stand by for that. But for now, let's move on in this study. Okay, we also see the false shepherds talked about in Isaiah. The false shepherds of Israel were considered greedy dogs. This is an amazing passage. His watchmen are blind. Those that should be watching out and teaching the shepherds that were to teach Israel, they are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. And in a large way, that's how the church is today. They cannot bark. They're sleeping. They're lying down. They love to slumber. Yea, they are greedy dogs, which can never have enough. They want more and more and more. They want more bigger churches. They want bigger empires. They want bigger control over people. They want bigger salaries. They want more materialism. They want more fun. They want more fellowship. They want more music. They are greedy dogs that never have enough. They are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way. They're selfish. Everyone to his gain, from his quarter. Come, ye say, they, I will fetch wine and we will fill ourselves with strong drink. They're drunk on the fornication of Babylon. They're drunk. They're sleeping. And tomorrow shall be as this day and much more abundant. It's all about what more fellowship, what more joy, what more satisfaction can we get out of this world? instead of patiently looking forward to the next world. Okay, we also see, when we look in the New Testament at the qualifications of the leaders of the church, we see a repeating theme. 1 Timothy 3, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, not greedy, a fil filthy lucre, not, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous not interested in the material possessions of this world. It's to live a humble life, a quiet and peaceable life, instructing, teaching, and shepherding the people of God. But we don't find that in today's leadership in the church. They're all looking for other things, how to, how to have more fun and more fellowship and more material possessions. 
For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre. Again in Titus 1.7. A couple verses later, there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. There's many false teachers in the church, false leaders, who subvert whole households, teaching things they which ought not. And why do they do it? For filthy lucre's sake. They water down the gospel. They don't want to teach an offensive gospel of the grace of God and God is his elective power and salvation. And the fact that Christians will be led by God to live a holy life. And that sin cannot be tolerated and there should be church discipline for sin. They don't want to teach those things because they're more interested in filthy lucre's sake. They're interested in material gain. They don't want to scare anybody away. The church today is full of easy believism. Make a decision. Keep sacraments. Let's grow the church. Bring everybody into the church you can possibly find. We'll have self-help groups for everybody. We'll help them out materially, physically. We'll do whatever we can to build the numbers. There's no church discipline. These mega churches are watered down entities. They, they don't, they're not really preaching the word of God. They have some Bible verses, but they go off on their own ideas. Political activism. Okay, and we as Christians know that riches are not important. Riches are not important. We, we need what we need to live. We need food. We need shelter. We need clothing. Jesus said unto them, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has not where to lay his head. We should think about that. Take a couple hours to think about Jesus Christ had no place to lay his head. He had no bed to go to at night. 2 Corinthians 8, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for, his, for our sakes, for your sakes, he became poor, that you through his poverty might be made rich. He went about as a person in poverty. Psalm 69, I am poor and sorrowful. Let thy salvation, O God, set me up on high. I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks upon me. You are my help and my deliverer. We're not meant to be rich in this world and chase our material possessions and our, our creature comforts. They that will be rich will fall into temptation and a snare and into many full, foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. The, the, the love of this world, the pride of life, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, all those things are worshiping other gods and idols. And in Revelation 3, we see the rich Laodicean church. It's that seventh church of the seven churches of Revelation. It's a parallel to Babylon. Because you say, I am rich. That's what Babylon says. I'm not a widow. I'll see no sorrow. I'm a queen. I have all of these riches. I live luxuriously and increase with goods and have need of nothing. And know not that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich. Our, our, our goal in this world is not to be comfortable. It's not to have all the material possessions, all the creature comforts of the world and spend all our time in that. We should spend all our time in, in prayer, Bible study. Obviously, we have to work to, to make money to eat and have a place to live, but that shouldn't be all-consuming in our life, and then we shouldn't go out there and want to buy all these material possessions that we don't need. We only need what we need to survive, and our, our main goal is to be a witness of Jesus Christ, to share the truth to, to, be, uh, to be, be ready to give a defense for the hope that's within us, to pray without ceasing, to learn, hear from God from the Bible, to love the Lord Jesus Christ and the salvation he's given to us. Isaiah 55, He that has no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. True salvation it doesn't cost anything. It's a free gift. Freely we have received, freely we share. There is no price on the gospel. The gospel is not to be made money off of and, and have gain and employment and everything else off of that. Okay, so now let's turn and we're going to look at very clear passages in Jude and Second Peter 2 that talks about these teachers in the church who merchandise, and the word merchandise is used in Second Peter 2. First, Jude. There are certain men crept in unawares. There's a lot of people that lead churches and are group leaders and pastors or, or priests or whatever. They seem like very good people, but they turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness. It's like, I'm okay, you're okay. There's no church discipline. We'll, we'll help you in your sin. 
We, we, we will we'll, we'll coach you on how to live a, a, a happy life. We'll make you happier. It's not about condemning sin and having church discipline. Everybody in the church is supposed to be have the Holy Spirit. They deny the only Lord God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Woe unto them, for they've gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily. They're greedy after the heir of Balaam for reward. They're, they're for reward. They're there to build a big church. They're there to have a community that they know they're going to be taken care of. It's all about, you may hear this in a lot of megachurches, it's all about community. Well, that, that's, that's, that's not found in the Bible. It's about fellowship, about true Christians sharing in prayer and the Bible and, and, and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. We also see in 2 Peter 2, there were false prophets among the people, even that there shall be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies. And through covetousness, and some of those damnable heresies are free will. It's that you don't have to be holy to be a Christian. You can live as the world and you're still saved. Make a free will decision. Just join our congregation and you're in. You're in the club. That's not, that's not being a Christian. It's when Christ reaches out to us and chooses us and brings us and draws us to himself. And we become filled with the Holy Spirit. That's true Christianity. And we, we, we bit by bit, even though we're in the flesh, we have a holy life. Through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. We're the merchandise. The people that are in the church are, are the merchandise. That's what makes the, the church rich and luxurious and makes it politically powerful. It makes the ability to commit fornication with all the inhabitants of the world and the kings of the world. It's, it's, it's through feigned words. It's through lies and covetousness. And they've forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. That's our warning from God and his holy word about what happens in the church. Another good example is Simon the sorcerer joins the church. Acts 8, a certain man called Simon had long been conjuring in the city and amazing the nation of Samaria, claiming himself to be some great one. All gave heed to him from the least of the great, saying, this one is the great power of God. But then Simon believed the gospel also, and being baptized, he continued with Philip, and seeing miracles and mighty works happening, he was amazed. He made a decision for Christ. He believed. He wanted to join what he saw as a powerful movement. But, but we find that Simon was seeking to merchandise the church. A few verses later, when Simon saw that the Holy Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power. Give me this power also, and whomever I lay, may lay hands, he may receive the Holy Spirit. He wanted the power, the power of Christianity, and he was willing to pay money for it. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because he thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. The church is not about merchandising and materialism. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. He believed, but he wasn't a Christian, because he didn't have the faith of Christ. Simple man-generated belief doesn't save anybody. It's only the faith of Christ that's a gift of God that's given to us. For Peter said, For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. He was not a Christian, but he joined the church. Simon the sorcerer joined the church, but he wanted power. Another classic example of merchandising in the church is Jesus and the den of thieves. It was the Passover. Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple. The temple is where, where, where uh, communion with God, it's, it's the worship of God in the temple. But instead he found those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple. Making money doesn't belong in the church. The, the worship of other gods and idols, the worship of the things of this world does not belong in the church. And he drove them all out of the temple, the sheep, the oxygen. He poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. All this is a symbol of judgment day. And said unto them, the salt doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. It doesn't belong in the church. That type of, all these parachurch ministries employing all these people and doing all these worldly things and, and making money off it and making money off of re religion and Christianity. His disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house has eaten me up. 
the, the goal of the church is to worship and praise God, to, to pray, to share the word of God, to evangelize. That's the goal of the church. It's not to have all these other ministries out there. A similar passage in Matthew 21, Jesus went to the temple of God and cast out all that sold and bought in the temple. And said, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And that's what the church is like when Christ returns again. Babylon is a den of thieves. It's full of money changers and all type of material things going on. And it's most primarily, it's fornication. It's the worship of other gods and idols. Okay, just a quick summary of this study. This is about merchandise and Christianity. We see that many, many church and parachurches exist. Christianity is huge. It's 2.4 billion Christians, and it's fueled and fired and made rich with delicious living because of the fornication. Fornication, which is the worship of other gods and idols. It's infiltrated the true church of God. There's many false people. There's many called, but few chosen. And the church is now so big that it's a political machine, and it's a merchandising machine as well. And the call of true Christians is to worship and serve God in prayer, the Word of God, hearing from God, service to others, witnessing, and many other similar things. And, and we see, however, Babylon is all about fornication, worldliness, and, and the love of this world. We're going to move on, and we want to hone in and look at exactly what the merchants and ships of Babylon represent. We can understand that by comparing scripture by scripture. Please consider subscribing to this channel, and thank you very much for watching this video.